What did you have for lunch? Oh, uh, like uh, chili and peppers and onions and chicken. Oh, sounds good. We need rescue inside the auditorium. Multiple victims. I got seven down in the theater night. Seven down. On July 20th, 2012, James Holmes walked into the Century 16 movie theater in Aurora, Colorado. It was the premiere of Batman The Dark Knight Rises. He was armed with ballistic armor and a pile of firearms. He would hit 70 people and take a dozen lives that night. But this devastating moment was only the beginning of his bizarre case. The investigation would reveal a troubled young man who saw nail ghosts and obsessed over the Batman's Joker in the most creepy way imaginable. This is the full story of James Holmes and the Aurora Theater Massacre. Aurora oh, where is your emergency? Well, I can't hear you. What address? This was the chaos a 911 dispatcher in Aurora, Colorado heard on July 20th, 2012. Just firing right and loud. Boom, boom, the loudest sound you can hear. The dispatcher couldn't make out an address, only screaming. But before the night was over, dozens more calls would pour in, all from the same spot, the Century 16 Cinema. And while the calls said sure at the theater, first, the last callers would talk about fallen children. I've got a child victim. I need rescue at the back door of Theater 9 now. I'm 9 News reporter Brandon Riddiman on the scene of breaking news in Aurora right now. A late night, apparently multiple shooting incident at a movie theater in Aurora. At around 12.45 a.m., Officer Jason Oviat apprehended 24-year-old James Holmes. He did not resist arrest. If anything, he seemed relieved that it was over. When he was interrogated later that night, he calmly described exactly what he had done during the movie. And I raised the shotgun and saw that people were getting up in like the back left corner. So I like shot up that direction. Surveillance footage inside the cinema painted a clear picture too. James entered the Century 16 theater just before midnight when the Dark Knight Rises premiere would start. He bought a ticket and then went into the theater, sitting in the front row. But 20 minutes into the movie, he got out, went to his car via the emergency exit door, and equipped himself with protective clothing, a gas mask, a load-bearing vest, a ballistic helmet, and bulletproof protectors. Finally, he put his headphones on and blasted music into his ears. He didn't want to hear the screams. Then he re-entered the theater through the exact same emergency door and through a gas canister. After that, all hell broke loose. There were 400 people inside that room, many of whom saw James enter, but thought he was dressed for the premiere or playing a prank. After the tear gas disrupted their vision, they were sitting ducks. James fired 76 in the theater, and then he continued firing in the hallway. With 12 people dead and 70 injured, it was Colorado's second deadliest mass shooting, just after the Columbine High School massacre. At the time, it was also the shooting with the largest number of victims in modern U.S. history. When they arrested James Holmes, the officers were surprised to learn that he had no criminal record. Apart from his bright orange hair, there was nothing that made him stand out. His behavior towards the officers was calm and compliant. The detectives had to take it from day one to understand how this person ended up committing such an atrocity. James Egan Holmes was born in San Diego on December 13, 1987, to Robert and Arlene. They were both smart, hardworking people. Arlene was a registered nurse, and Robert was a scientist with degrees from UCLA, UC Berkeley, and Stanford University. He and his sister were still toddlers when the family moved to a tiny town called Castroville only to return to San Diego as young teens. Everyone who knew the family in both places thought they were the American dream. James Holmes was the product of a very brilliant family. From a superficial standpoint, his life does seem picture perfect, but it wasn't. Like many kids of wealthy, educated parents, James did what he was expected. He excelled in school. But when it came to social skills, James had horrific anxiety. He didn't have a personality that drew people to him. So here you have this really strange dynamic of someone who's bright, who has choices, the potential for scholarships, to be anything he wants to be, yet he's a loser when it comes to socializing. 
As a teenager, James felt unable to make friends. Instead, he spent all his free time at home playing video games in his room. And when he wasn't playing video games, James was curled up in a corner, scared of his hallucinations. Sadly, there were cases of psychosis or schizophrenia in his family, and he was one of the unlucky ones who inherited this. First, he would hear loud bangs on his walls. Then he would hear characters named nail ghosts. In his mind, they were making a ruckus meant to drive him crazy. It's one thing if these nightmares or these hallucinations happen once or twice, but it appears that these were consistent as James grew up. James's parents knew nothing of this sort. They were sad he refused to go out and make friends, but they just had no idea how far his mental issues went. Only when he tried taking his own life did they realize he needed help. After this incident, Arlene and Robert took their son to a psychiatrist. He was diagnosed with a psychotypical personality disorder. This meant that James suffered from severe social anxiety and saw himself as an outcast, unable to belong to a group. The family also went to therapy together for a year until James told his parents he was feeling better. He wasn't better. He just wanted it to stop. But he was putting on a good show. He'd graduated from a prestigious high school and had just been accepted to UC Riverside to study neuroscience. All right, our next speaker is James Holm. He has gra What school did you graduate from? Westview High School. He just graduated from Westview High School and will be attending the University of California, Riverside. He will be majoring in neuroscience. His goals are to become a researcher and to make scientific discoveries. When he spoke of his work, James sounded passionate although shy when talking to crowds. And then the image appears, and we keep doing this over and over again, and it would increase up to around 200 milliseconds. This was his presentation at a summer internship before college. His lab professor, John Jacobson, would describe him as extremely shy and fixated on doing things his way. After graduating from UC Riverside, he applied to six universities for a doctorate in neuroscience, but all of them rejected him. At the interviews, he was quiet and aloof, unable to present himself well. Around this time, James moved back in with his parents and retreated to increasingly violent video games. He found himself developing this persona in video games. By slaying virtual enemies, James felt powerful. He was compensating for the lack of power he felt in real life. The depression, the loneliness, the feeling of social exclusion. And as escaping the real world became his only coping mechanism, James also became obsessed with the Dark Knight trilogy. I think that the Dark Knight trilogy is the latest and most compelling of all of the Batman franchise. Everyone in the audience was blown away by Heath Ledger's performance. He didn't look like any other or sound like any other Joker. Batman had been around for decades, but The Dark Knight made it a little darker. When James saw that 2008 Batman movie, he saw Heath Ledger's Joker and fell in love with the character. He is drawn to the Joker character. And you have to ask yourself, why? The Joker doesn't really have any friends. The Joker doesn't really belong. Yet, people are fearful of him. If they couldn't respect him out of love, they would out of fear. And as a way to feel powerful, James began copying the Joker. In 2010, he managed to enroll in a graduate program. But after failing a lab and a relationship attempt with a fellow student, James saw the university psychiatrist, Dr. Lynn Fenton. When he confessed to having thoughts about taking his own life, Dr. Fenton asked him for more details. To this, James replied, people are my problem, and the only solution is to kill everyone. But that can't happen because it isn't realistic. James assured Dr. Fenton that he wasn't planning on taking any lives, his own included. She concluded that he wasn't a threat to others or himself, but prescribed him OCD medication to help curb his obsessive thinking. But James thought of therapists as mind racists. This is how he referred to them in his diary. James was also inspired by Heath Ledger to start journaling. When Heath Ledger landed the role of the Joker, he changed his lifestyle, isolating himself from his girlfriend and baby daughter and going down a mentally unstable path just to think like the Joker thinks. He would also take notes about his mental decline and tips on how to play the Joker. For James, this idea was enlightening, but he wouldn't be like Heath. 
he would be like the Joker. In his diary, he wrote about keeping up appearances, including with therapists. He couldn't let them know he was planning a massacre, as they would help stop the massacre. In his notebook, he writes something that the Joker said. The message is there is no message. It's a bunch of angry rantings that are confusing and perplexing from a self-absorbed, tortured, and conflicted young man. If you look at his journal, the message is to create total chaos. There is no message. It's to destroy, just like the Joker. James Holmes was descending into chaos, hatred, and paranoia, but this didn't stop him from wanting to date girls. In February 2012, he met another student, and for the first time ever, James felt like he maybe had a girlfriend. If this was just a typical college romance, at least for the girl, it seemed casual. For James, it seemed that it was becoming more intense. And intense he got. A few months into casually seeing each other around the campus, James snapped after class and said he wanted to kill people. His girlfriend asked him ironically, why don't you kill me? To which James replied, I can't really do that. I'd get into trouble. Yeah. That was holding him back, that he would get into trouble. His girlfriend broke up with him right there and then. James was devastated. His ego was hurt so badly that the only cure he saw was embodying the Joker even more. One similarity that is very clear between the Joker and James was the Joker, of course, always has that constant smirk. James also sometimes had a smirk. It was a creepy kind of smirk. So creepy that some of his lab colleagues suggested he see a psychiatrist. He saw a different doctor this time, and this time, he was more open about planning a massacre. Then he dropped out of school. Now he was 24-7, home alone, with his darkest thoughts. He convinced himself that everyone rejected him, and that his only way out was to take all their lives. Throughout 2012, his journal detailed complex plans of taking several lives in one go. This is an individual that is having grave conflicts within his self, within his identity, within his brain. On June 7th, James bought his first rifle. Then came the explosives he'd ordered online. This is as good as time as any to ask why a troubled individual like him was able to make this online order in the first place. That same summer, James left a voice message for the owner of an arsenal. He spoke like the Joker, laughed inappropriately, and said he needed to squash his college mates one by one, as he had a problem with them. That's why he needed his firearms. It was a terrifying message that the Arsenal owner never responded to, but he didn't raise the alarm either. By July 20th, James was loaded with firearms, he had dyed his hair bright orange, and was free to storm the Century 16 movie theater. There wasn't much James could tell detectives that they didn't already know. The diary retrieved from his one-bedroom apartment detailed his entire attack, and so did the surveillance cameras at Century 16. The diary also showed a long list of massacre methods that James discarded with reasons like too suspicious or requires too much knowledge. Thankfully, James was caught at the theater before he could lure authorities to his apartment. You see, he'd booby-trapped the place with several types of bombs. If his plan had worked, many more people would have died, and James would have fulfilled one of his favorite scenes from The Dark Knight. James had left loud music playing in his apartment to lure neighbors to open the door and cause the explosion. Incredibly, one of his neighbors did go in in an attempt to speak to James about the music, but at the last minute, she turned back and called authorities. The wires of the bombs in James's room were cut by a robot wearing a camera. During his interrogation, James was calm and reserved, almost as if he'd reverted to the shy boy. Do you need anything? Oxygen. As he awaited his trial, he gave another interview, in which he was more compliant. What would you have for lunch? Oh, uh, like uh, chili and peppers and onions and chicken. Sounds good. He talked the detective through his entire plan and shared any details he requested. This, for example, is how he exited via the emergency door 20 minutes into the movie. Pulled out my phone to make it look like I had a phone call and then went out the exit for that reason. Any particular thoughts, preparations, 
getting ready, psyching yourself up, anything like that? Um, I put uh, my music on, on my headphones, on my wireless headphones. James revealed that he had his last second thoughts while in his car getting changed. He even called a mental health hotline, expecting a sign not to go through with his evil plan. But when there was no answer, he took it as a sign that he should. After that, he went on autopilot mode. But then I uh, threw the gun down and switched to the AR-15. And uh, I don't remember where I shot those ones either, except for like two people who tried to run away and I shot like three shots at them. How about the sound? What did all that sound like? Um, well, I'd had my music in to drown out uh, sounds. And I think they just said an earbud. James wanted to rain hell on society, but he did not want to hear individual screams. James's trial started on December 8, 2014, after many delays caused by evaluations of his mental condition. During the trial, the prosecutor described the Century 16 scene as bullets, blood, brains, and bodies. This is what James Holmes had left behind, he said, including the body of a six-year-old, Veronica Sullivan. There wasn't any children hurt in it. Uh, I don't know, we'll get to that. It's almost funny how James was such a bright kid academically, yet he couldn't fathom that what he did that night affected people of all ages. Very slowly did he come to terms with the consequences of his plan. The details about the crime scene left the whole courtroom gasping or in tears. Even the seasoned judge was visibly affected. He had this seemingly permanent smirk on his face. The Joker always had that same grin on his face, too, so the similarities are, are strangely um, very familiar to each other. But a copycat smirk and even the psychotypal diagnosis were not enough to find James not guilty. Not guilty by reason of insanity means the killer did not know right from wrong at the time of the incident. In James's case, that's just not true. Sanity plea didn't hold up because he had plotted and planned this attack so methodically that there was no way he could fall back on the insanity plea. Fenton, please stand for the reading of the sentencing, the final sentencing verdict forms. James Holmes was found guilty on 12 counts of first degree murder, plus 140 counts of attempted murder. He was sentenced to 12 consecutive life sentences without parole, plus 3,318 years. This is one of the longest sentences in American history. Of course, life in prison without the possibility of parole would have been the same amount of time for James. He will die in prison, but the shocking number of years goes to show the gravity of what he did. The judge made this clear if there was ever a case that warranted the maximum sentences, this is the case. 100% sure that these are just and fair. I want to make it clear that it is the court's intention that the defendant never set foot in free society again. Get the defendant out of my courtroom, please. Thank you. Yep, there were cheers and claps as James was taken away. In a way, it was a victory for humanity, even for life. James had become what he wanted to, an agent of chaos and a harbinger of destruction. Now, he has his whole life to think about it. But the families of all those he left without a future are still recovering from the tragedy. It'll be a long time before they can forgive or even forget this awful person. Arlene says that not a day goes by without her thinking of all the victims James left behind. Arlene issued an apology when her son couldn't. But will this ever be enough to make up for the scars James left on the world? Thanks for watching, you guys. What are your thoughts on this case? Do you know killers similar to James Holmes? Let me know in a comment, and before you go, don't forget to like and subscribe.